Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing only on the highest yield material. In today's video, we're going to be covering all of the important immunodeficiencies. That will include things like X-linked A-gamma globinemia, IgA deficiency, chronic granulomatous disease, DeGeorge syndrome, uh, severe combined immunodeficiency, and a few other ones. This is the eighth video in the chapter covering inflammation and immunology. So I hope after watching this video, you will check out the rest of the videos in this playlist. Keeping with the theme from the rest of the chapter where a majority of the material from inflammation and immunology covers diseases that result when the immune system is too strong or not strong enough. We've already covered a couple examples of this and we'll continue to do so in the last couple videos in the section. In this video, we're covering immunodeficiencies, which are obviously when the immune response is too low and pathogens are allowed to infect the patient. There's some key phrases or buzzwords that should pop out to you when you're reading the question stems for the step one exam. These things help give you clues that should point you to, towards immunodeficiency being the answer. Often the keyword is going to be recurrent or recurrent infections of some sort. Anybody can get an isolated infection, but if a patient is having frequent infections, that is a sign that their immune system is not functioning properly. Immunodeficient people also tend to get infections in various different locations. So they'll have skin, ear, throat, whatever, but they've got all kinds of different organ systems that are being affected. Failure to thrive which is when an infant is very small for their age, is also something that can be a red flag for immunodeficiency. A lot of these disorders are inherited and therefore they're going to present pretty early in life. We've already covered in other videos the different immune processes that help protect us from pathogens. And now we're going to learn about what happens when specific processes that we've covered aren't functioning correctly. And when something like the B cells or the T cells aren't working properly, you're going to see a specific presentation that results primarily from whatever group of pathogens that process tries to combat. This simplifies things a bit because immunodeficiencies that have a similar pathophysiology will present with the same microbes and some similar symptoms. This table is a bit oversimplified, but for step one, this should get you where you need to go and be able to help you get these questions correct. When B cells aren't functioning properly, you're primarily going to see bacterial infections and Giardia infections. One of the ways I remember this is B for B cell and bacteria. When T cells are deficient, you're primarily going to see viral infections and Canada infections. When the complement system, specifically the MAC complex, is deficient, you're going to primarily see Neisseria infections. When you're having a problem with free radical generation, you are mostly going to see problems with catalase positive pathogens. So now that you understand the pathophysiology and what's broken, what you're going to get infected with, we can talk about the groups of immunodeficiencies that present with these symptoms. You're going to have problems with B cells in X-linked A-gamma globinemia, IgA deficiency, hyper-IgM syndrome, and severe combined immunodeficiency. You're going to have T cell problems in DeGeorge syndrome and severe combined immunodeficiency. Complement problems are going to be in a MAC deficiency. I'm not going to go into much more detail with the complement problems. In this video, it's not super high yield. There's not a ton to know for those questions, but if you want to look back at the video which covered complement, you can learn a little bit more about that. A deficiency of one of those complement proteins. Then for free radical generation, we're going to be primarily talking about chronic granulomatous disease and myeloperoxidase deficiency. I also want to quickly mention hyper IgM syndrome, which I'm not going to go into too much detail about. Uh, we covered it somewhat in our antibody video when we discussed class switching because hyper IgM syndrome is when you have a inability to class switch due to a defect in the CD40 ligand. So what you end up with hyper IgM syndrome is really high levels of IgM 
and almost no detectable amounts of the other isotopes. You can look back at the antibody uh, video to learn more about class switching and that disease. We're going to start with X-linked A-gamma globinemia, which is also sometimes referred to as Bruton's A-gamma globinemia. You can see here in the top right corner, I'm giving it a high yield rating of 3, which is a rating scale from 0 to 10 that rates the importance of certain topics for the USMLE Step 1 Medical Board exam. It is a rare mutation in the Bruton tyrosine kinase enzyme, which is important for the signal transduction that results in B cell maturation. Because the B cell maturation is inhibited, there are only immature B cell precursors present. So you don't really have B cells, you've got the precursors to B cells. There is a resulting lack of the germinal centers in the lymph nodes because that's where the B cells normally differentiate, proliferate, and hang out. There's very low levels of B cells present in the circulation, as well as almost no antibody of any class, because these precursor B cells don't have the ability to make antibodies. The lack of antibodies manifests primarily as a susceptibility to encapsulated bacteria that result in things like pneumonia, otitis media, cellulitis, etc. The defect is not apparent until about six months of age because infants are protected for the first few months of life by antibodies they've received from their mother. As the name would suggest, it's an X-linked disorder and therefore it's going to be much more common in boys than girls. Next we're going to do selective IgA deficiency, which is what it sounds like. It's a selective deficiency only of IgA, not of the other types of antibody. It is the most common immunodeficiency. However, most people don't know that they have it because it's usually asymptomatic. This deficiency usually isn't diagnosed until you have one of a couple rare circumstances. One is a healthy patient receives a blood transfusion and has an anaphylactic reaction to the IgA in the donated blood. Also, a very small number of people with IgA deficiency have recurrent mucosal infections, ears, GI system, respiratory, etc. And this is often going to present as infections with Giardia because, remember, IgA is the mucosal antibody, so that's why you're going to get mucosal infections. You're not going to be as susceptible to other types of infections because you have normal levels of all of the other isotopes. DeGeorge syndrome is an abnormal development of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches that causes an absence of the thymus and parathyroid glands. The absence of the thymus means that T cells cannot mature, and the absence of the parathyroid glands causes a low level of parathyroid hormone. This congenital hypoparathyroidism leads to low calcium levels, which is obviously going to present with twitching, spasms, etc. The low levels of T cells leads to susceptibility to viral and candida infections. DeGeorge syndrome also has some associations with truncus arteriosus and facial abnormalities, such as a cleft palate or low set ears. One of the key words and question stems for DeGeorge syndrome is the absence of the thymic shadow on chest x-ray. So the thymus isn't there, and you can sometimes see that on x-ray. However, the absence of the thymic shadow on chest x-ray is not specific to DeGeorge. So when you see that, you can't automatically pick DeGeorge syndrome because you could be wrong sometimes. What you need to rule out is severe combined immunodeficiency because it also has this finding. And you're going to have a T-cell deficiency in both of them, obviously, because you don't have a thymus. But what else accompanies the T-cell deficiency is different between both of them. So in DeGeorge, we already talked about how you're going to have a low parathyroid hormone and the symptoms related to that. And in severe combined immunodeficiency, you're going to have a B-cell deficiency. Severe combined immunodeficiency is a T-cell deficiency combined with a B-cell deficiency. This can either be caused by a defect in IL-2 receptor, interleukin-2 receptor, or dysfunction of the adenosine deaminase enzyme. When this is defective, adenosine builds up and it becomes toxic to B and T cells. As we've already mentioned, there's an absence of the thymic shadow on chest x-rays similar to DeGeorge syndrome. There's obviously going to be low levels of circulating T cells, as well as low levels of all the different types of immunoglobulins. The next two immunodeficiencies we're going to cover 
involve dysfunction of free radical formation. In a previous video about free radicals, we went into a lot of depth about how free radicals are formed and their role in disease. We ended up building this graph, which looks a little scary, but we went through it step by step to make it less scarier and easier to understand. So if you haven't done so already, I would suggest going back to the free radical video and learning this, because if you don't understand this pathway, you're not going to understand these last two diseases we're going to cover. You can click this black box right here to be taken directly to that video. Chronic granulomatous disease, or CGD, is an X-linked recessive defect in NADPH oxidase enzyme. Without functioning NADPH oxidase, superoxide cannot be generated in the phagosome. Superoxide is a free radical used by the phagocytes to destroy whatever material it phagocytoses. There is also lower detectable levels of other free radicals which are downstream of superoxide, such as peroxide and hydrochlorous acid, because superoxide can be converted to those free radicals through a number of intermediate steps. Without these free radicals, things like neutrophils cannot kill bacteria and other microbes it ingests. And what ends up happening is because you can't kill these microbes, your body forms granulomas around the bacteria. It's basically a way to quarantine the microbe from the rest of the body. It forms a circular walled structure around this microbe to wall it off from the rest of the body. And that's how this disease gets its name. This disease makes you susceptible to catalase positive infections. Catalase-positive organisms are primarily going to include Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, and Aspergillus. Most microorganisms are catalase-negative, meaning they don't have the catalase enzyme. So the small amount of peroxide that they naturally produce is not broken down and can be converted to HOCl, hydrochlorous acid, by the neutrophils. Those neutrophils are then going to have free radicals to break down the pathogens. So again, most organisms don't have catalase, which means their peroxide that they produce hangs out for a while. Neutrophils convert that into free radicals, which they can use to kill the organism that made the peroxide. So that's why catalase negative infections are not a problem with people with free radical deficiencies. You can't make your own free radicals, but you can kind of steal peroxide from the microorganism you're trying to kill and use that to then kill the microorganism. So for example, with CJD, even though you lack superoxide, if you can make HOCl from the peroxide from the microorganism, uh, you're not gonna see a lot of those infections. Catalase positive organisms are obviously going to be the opposite. These bacteria still produce a small amount of peroxide, but they have their own catalase enzyme, which is going to then break down that peroxide. And when you have a deficiency of your own free radicals and you can't make free radicals from the microbes peroxide, then you're going to be susceptible to infections from these microbes. There are some keywords here for chronic granulomatous disease, the nitro blue tetrazoleum test. Uh, from what I understand, it's not used that commonly anymore, but it still shows up a lot on tests for a couple of reasons. One reason is a lot of these step one questions are very old, so... They're not necessarily up to date on current practices, but also because this test clearly illustrates some key differences between chronic granulomatous disease and MPO deficiency or myeloperoxidase deficiency. Both these diseases have a very similar clinical picture, but this test allows you to differentiate between the two. CJD patients, when given the nitro blue tetrazoleum test are going to have an abnormal result or a negative result. And this sometimes is described in the question as failing to turn blue like it should. The MPO deficient patients when given this test are going to have a normal result or a positive result, which is going to turn blue. Myeloperoxidase deficiency is obviously a deficiency of the MPO enzyme, which creates HOCl or hydrochlorous acid from peroxide. And this HOCl is important for phagocytes because it is used to destroy phagocytose material just like superoxide. 
which is why this disease presents very similarly to chronic granulomatous disease. That brings us to the end of this video. If you like this video and would like to see more, please do help me sort of proofread these videos. I'm sure there's going to be a decent amount of mistakes and typos. Uh, some people have already found a couple in previous videos, so if you see something that seems a little off, make a comment so that I can fix it. The next video in the Inflammation and Immunology chapter is going to cover the four main types of hypersensitivity, type 1, 2, 3, and 4. If you'd like to watch that video and learn that material, please click on this black box here and you'll be taken directly to that video. Thank you very much and good luck with the rest of your studying.